This episode is sponsored by quality and innovative Game Boar cartridges. Game Boar shot shells are the choice of world champion David Radulovich and 26 times world champion George Digweed MBE. White Gold and Dark Storm contain precision made diamond shot, manufactured exclusively in England and coupled with high performance smooth velocities, providing less felt recoil. If you're serious about your scores, you have to shoot with the best. When every clay counts, make sure you never compromise. Game Boar is the most decorated feat task and sporting clay shot shells in the sports history. Available now throughout the US, exclusively from KL Ammo. Find them online at www.gameboarus.com. Game Boar are simply the champion's choice. Welcome to the Dead Pair Podcast with your hosts, Jason Rambo and Sean Alley. We bring you all things sporting clays. Our focus is bringing new shooters to the sport and helping all shooters by giving you the most useful info from coaches, pro shooters, gun clubs, product and service specialists. The Dead Pair Podcast, what every shotgun shooter wants to hear. Paul? Hey everyone, it's Jason Rambo with my large mammal friend, Mr. Alley. What's up, Sean? Large and in charge, you That's forgot to say. Large and in charge, yes. <laughs> I forgot you wanted that tagline. You so. betcha, you betcha. So how's it going, man? Good, good. Just uh, busy, busy, busy with uh, work and, uh, you know, trying to get out and do more shooting, but little, that's a hard thing to do these days. A little, little bit of a frustrating day for you. Yeah, I lost my main computer at work and my personal computer, which has all my QuickBooks files and invoices and all that fun stuff. So I got right. another one on the way, and hopefully we get that up and running tomorrow. But today was kind of a loss. Well, let's talk about sporting clay, something a little more fun. That huh? sounds that sounds excellent. <laughs> I'm all about that. <laughs> hey, so the Western Regional, uh, Gavin Miles, overall champion, and Karen Shedd, his girlfriend, won the Winchester Ladies Cup. So. Yeah, congratulations to Con- both those yeah, guys. Uh, absolutely. Good shooting. And... Big shoots coming up, man. A lot of them. A lot of them. Uh, I just talked to Dominic Bethel the other day. He is busting his can down there at the Meadows, getting things ready. Um, he, man, that's going to be a super cool regional. Yep. Yep. That should be awesome. If, if uh, my wife and my mother wouldn't disown me, I would be there. Um, we are auctioning off the real estate, or not the real estate, but the uh, estate uh, there at the family farm and then getting the farm ready to sell and the auction just happened to fall on that day, and I could strangle some people for scheduling it <laughs> at the time of the regional. Yeah, but that's the old it. adage, uh, if I only knew then what I knew now, that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of which, um, Sean, if you remember correctly, back when we first started shooting, I told you I was going to get my gun fit, and you looked at me like I had this unicorn horn growing out of my head. <laughs> um, my dad, who we used to shoot with a lot, um, he, he told me, I told him, I said, man, it's just guns bruising the heck out of me, you know, and it seems like this one target, I'm just, you know, and he's like, you need to go get your gun fit. I'm like, what, what are you talking about? And went through the process, and I actually went to uh, Jim Eister, mm-hmm. if you remember correctly. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and what a difference it made, you know, and then you got your gun fit, and then our buddy got, JD got his gun fit, and yep. it made a huge difference. So, it did, it did. Probably one of the best investments of all the money that we blew in the wrong direction. That's probably one of the best investments we made. Yeah, because as everybody will tell you that knows, if your gun don't fit and it don't shoot where you're pointing it at, you're fighting a losing battle, basically. Yeah, absolutely. Um, We've got a man coming on tonight that is the authority Mm -hmm. on gun fit and custom stocks. Mr. Jim Greenwood, very excited to speak with him. And... (laughs) <laughs> I know he's been on the show a lot lately, but uh, our coach and friend of the show, Bill Elliott, is actually at his residence right as we speak. So we'll pick his brain while he's down there, you know, and see yep. what the heck's going on there. So let's uh, let's get Jim on the show. We got to do a quick commercial break here, and uh, we'll get Jim on the phone. Sound good to you? Sounds like a winner. You're just sitting there smiling at me. I am. I'm the, excited. I want to hear all this the, stuff. The, the people can't see you shaking your head, Sean. They I can know. Only it's, hear you. it's not video. It's audio. So, <laughs> yes, yes. I'm excited. Ready to go. All right, buddy. Cool. 
American-made Atlas traps are made right here in Kansas and feature the finest quality, innovation, and support in the business. Atlas traps are made using aircraft quality aluminum and stainless steel to ensure your traps will outlast the competition. So whether you're an individual needing a private trap for practice and recreation, or a club needing to outfit your entire facility, family-owned and operated Atlas traps can suit all your needs. Visit atlastraps.com to see the full line of commercial and recreational traps and accessories. With prices that won't make you see red and quality that won't leave you feeling blue, Atlas has the finest equipment available. RE Ranger, you can't hit what you can't see. With 14 clay sight lenses manufactured by Carl Zeiss Vision, Ranger lenses add target clarity and contrast no matter the lighting condition. Visit reranger.com for all your shooting eyewear needs, free shipping and returns in the U.S. on orders of $90 or more, and if you use the code DEADPAIR at checkout, you will save 10% off your order. See it further. See it faster. See it with precision with RE Ranger. All right. On the phone with us, we have Mr. Jim Greenwood. Jim, how are you doing this evening? Very good. How are you guys? Good, doing real good. Mr. Elliot is down there with you, correct? Yes, he is. What's up, I'm Bill? Just watching. I'm just, well, we're doing great. Uh, Steve Miller is down here from Columbus with me also, and we're just watching Jim grind away. It's, it's the Jim show. We're not doing anything. So you're watching the magic take place is what you're saying. Yeah, it's crazy. I'm going to tell you from like 8.30 a.m. nonstop bell to bell. It's, it's, it's work, man. It's, it's unbelievable. I they make a lot of wood chips. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of wood chips. A lot yeah. of wood chips. Well, I'm going to take a picture, actually, and I'll, I'll prove that, okay? Gotcha. <laughs> well, it's nice that we were able to call and give Jim a break. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, Jim, we were just speaking of the importance of proper gun fit, and, you know, for a shooter that's just getting started, I mean, arguably, it's probably the most important part of your equipment is making sure that gun fits, regardless of what kind of gun it is, correct? Correct. Yeah. And it's going to help the mount help everything. You know, they have to learn to mount the gun, but if all the dimensions are wrong, they're never going to learn a proper gun mount either. So definitely got to get the length right, pitch angle right, and get the comb and everything set up. Whether And that's not even just building a custom stock. It's working with their original stock just so they can learn a style, learn, a, learn to mount the gun, learn to get all through those processes. Right. Gotcha. Well, Jim, I got a question. Um, so, you know, what point really, I mean, realistically, should a shooter really start thinking about getting a custom stock? Is it, do you have to reach like a certain experience level or get comfortable it, with shooting to a point before you really even want to think about getting a custom stock? Yeah. You've got to get to a stage of comfort and, you know, it's hard to say what class, but knowing that you've got a consistent style, a good mount, working with somebody even to in whether that's, you know, a year or two or how long and how dedicated you're going to be to it. Okay. And, uh, figuring it all out. Then I said, it mainly has to have a good mount and I've worked with the mount when person's here, but you know, has to have, you know, a little bit of consistency there to help my end out everything else of what, what we're trying to achieve. Gotcha. Cause you have a, you got you gotta have at least a basic, understanding of how you shoot and what you're trying to achieve right um before it really Correct. makes sense to do it is there yeah cause, cause if you can't get mounted right we, we set all the dimensions up and we go out to shoot man we're going to be all over the place and it's not anything we've done it's just because you haven't learned to put the gun in the right place either so you have to learn a style learn what you're doing seeing targets everything else okay and is it most often that somebody's coming to you say say once they have that figured out is the reason that most people come to you, is it to try to fix a problem that they're having that they can't seem to achieve with their current gun? Or is it more along the lines you're just trying to really, really dial that fit in to where it's just absolutely perfect? It's kind of both. It's kind of some of them. I've had them that where the stock they're shooting hurts. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't feel right. Can't sit in their shoulder right. Can't make the factory stock fit the way they want it to. So they come to me so we can get the grip set right, get all the other dimensions right, and just change how the gun recoils, how it feels in our shoulder, 
just getting everything squared away for them. Well, to back up just a minute even further, Jim, um, the the new guy, okay, he, he buys himself an off-the-shelf gun. Can you do a little explaining on what cast on and cast off is and, you know, help a guy understand what the stock has to do in order to get his eye in line with the barrel correctly? Okay, yeah. Whatever shoulder you're shooting off of, your dominant eye there is the rear sight. So we've got to get that lined up. So for a right-handed shooter, as a general rule, the stock is offset to the, if you're looking down from the back side of the gun, it's offset to the right. So we can get our eye down the center of the barrel, having to cant the gun or roll their head over or do odd things that <laughs> that is too hard to repeat all the time. Right. So a left-handed shooter, just the opposite. So going, you know, moving the stock to the to the left. It doesn't always happen that way, but that's the general rule. What happens? Um, and then height-wise, getting their eye above the barrel to the right place. So number one, the gun doesn't bite them in the face and kick them in the face too hard, but get it where the gun impact isn't a foot high either. Right. Sure. So and that's adjusting off the comb. The higher the gun shoots, the lower we need to make the comb. Um, and I'm going to chime in because I can tell you we're, we're definitely, both Steve and I are definitely both going into the patterning board and making adjustments from that. We're mounting the gun. Um, Jim's not telling us right now because Steve and I come here with a pretty proficient mount. He's not telling us, hey, you have to mount the gun this way or that way, which is cool to see. I think if he saw a flaw in our mounts, he would say, Hey, you know what? You might want you, I would suggest thinking about this, but we're definitely, you know, we're go to the parenting board, take a little off and, you know, we're shooting targets here, you know, so it's a process along the way that you're look, like, he's talking about, I'm going to take a little toe off. I'm going to, I'm going to add a little bit here. I'm going to take a little bit out there. And so everything he's talking about, he's definitely, you know, speaking to what he does. Okay. So with adjusting on a you know, on a customer's factory stock, you know, we can play with there's some things we can't do, but we can play with the length and the pitch angle, comb height, cast. Um, the more thing like Bill was saying, when when we go to the pattern board, I'm watching the shooter shoot. I want to make sure they're putting the gun in the right place. They're putting it in the same place every time, instead of making adjustments as they come up and do different things of you know, because Shooting a pattern board can be tricky. We're, you don't want to aim at it, but right. trying to shoot with a dead gun. So I take a lot of that into account. I'm watching the person's barrel, watching the shooter, taking all that into account. And instead of just watching where the impact point is, I'm watching what the shooter is doing to make sure they're getting the gun mounted correctly or in the same spot. And if they're, because as they mount too low on their shoulder, it's going to throw the barrel high. So it shows it's shooting high, but it may not be the true high it may be just because it missed their mount wrong so trying to keep all that in line as we go through the process the fitting process everything right so sean has an adjustable butt plate on his gun and it's kind of like twisted but yep. but the gun fits him properly how, how do you go about making a stock without having this you know r2d2 looking thing on the back of the gun i mean how, how do you Oh, with me. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I, I build, you know, when a person comes in for the pattern, the stock is big, so I can build the toe out into the gun um, so we don't have to have the adjustable butt plate. So we can build that toe out and adjust for it's the pitch angle and the toe out to get it setting in, in the pocket in the proper place so we get the gun straight up and down. Um, so we play with things that way when we're mounting to watch. Is it digging in? in the Is the toe digging in if it is? Do we need to take more toe out? Do we need just pitch angle a little bit? Things we do so we can, so we don't have to have the adjustable butt plate on there, working with all the cast, building it all into the stock. Gotcha. So since Bill chimed in, then that's this is a good time for the question we had for both of you. Um, Bill, you know we know you're down there with Jim because of a fitment issue, but can you explain? And Jim, can you kind of chime in here on the problem? that bill was having and what you're having to do to fix it um one of the things the the heel of the gun was low so it sits way low in his shoulder when he goes to mount 
So you can get away with on some targets, but then you start getting overhead birds, tower birds. Under recoil, the gun doesn't stay put. The gun slips down out of the pocket. So now everything's not right. So we just try and bring that heel as a, as a stock up. So we get it into a good spot in the shoulder so we can get, and it helps felt recoil. Um, it's going to stay put under, under shooting. So you can transition to the second shot so much better. The gun hasn't slipped out, moved. So you can transition to the second shot, shot so much better. And then with the toe out, getting it so it helps the felt recoil. So the gun's driving straight back not just a little part of the pad fitting on the shoulder. We'll try and get the whole pad on our shoulder to, to maximize. We bought the whole pad, so might as well use it right. to help the felt recoil on our shoulder. Gotcha. gotcha. Well, Jim, i got a couple questions here in a string, so I'm going to break them up here to make life easy for you. So okay. when, when customers come to you, do you see that they're mostly concerned about the fit and functionality of the stock that you're making for them? And conversely, you know, how many of them are concerned more about the appearance and the, you know, the finish of the wood and so on and so forth when they go buy a custom stock? Um, most of them, especially the pattern stage, are all concerned about the fit. Okay. Gotcha. Making it comfortable, making it so they can handle the gun, shoot the gun, impact where it wants to be. Then, you know, once they're happy there, then we can go on and, and do a final nice stock, do it on a nice piece of wood. Um, my patterns I use are all wood. I rough them out. I start with a blank and have them all inletted before the customer arrives. But they're very large, so they're shaped down. Um they're they're look like a stock. They're just yeah. not super fancy woods, but pattern stock. But they're not bad. I mean, they're um, I use American walnut for my patterns. Um, so there's some figure in them still, but they're solid in that way. I can come out and we balance it as well. So during the pattern process, while they're shooting it, it's going to have the same feel that it will once we go transition to a final stock. That the balance point is the same. The grip's going to be the same. Everything. The main difference is, is there's going to be checkering on the final and there's not checkering on the pattern. Gotcha. Well, and you mentioned about the, the American walnut that you're using for the wood. Is that Does that seem to be the most common um, wood that you're using? Are there other wor- woods that you can use? or I mean, what, what my, do the customers dictate to you as far as like yeah, what the my, choices my, are? My, my patterns, I use American walnut just because of the price. Mm-hmm. I buy them by the pallet load, so the economics of that for the pattern, and they work down faster. Um, just so it's a price point deal on that. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. the final, most of the final stocks I use, probably 90% are Circassian walnut, Turkish walnut. Um, to have some English I use once in a while, I use some American depending on the project, but definitely the majority of is Circassian walnut that I, the final stocks are made out of. Okay. Gotcha. And, and then the last thing I was going to ask you is when people come to you, do you see, um, or I guess I should, I should ask you, what's your preference on like a traditional gun stock versus something fancier like a thumb hole stock i mean i'm sure you probably see it all um is there any benefit to like a thumb hole stock versus a traditional stock or other options that are out there for stocks well thumb hole is hard to build on uh, over and under just because the bolts in the way mm-hmm. um basically i've only done one of those through the years normally i guess i'd say i'm pretty conventional style building stock my background was building high-end custom rifles so more of a traditional shaped stock um i do monte carlos if it dictates on the customer but i don't do a whole lot of monte carlos only if i think it needs it when we're going through the process my patterns are large enough i can make them into it but you know i'm more concerned with where this how the gun sits in the shoulder how it's handling recoil everything else so Pretty much, pretty conventional style stock that I make. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I use a, uh, a Beretta DT11, and I got the ACS version that has the Monte Carlo stock with the BFAST system, so it's got the the adjustable um, comb. comb and, uh, sorry, yes, and the, and the, also the adjustable rib. So I was kind of able to finagle mine to make it work for me <laughs> by that by that means instead of going the route of a custom stock. So for now, I'm pretty happy with it, but that's, that's good that you say that because I imagine that Typically with a Monte Carlo stock, you're probably dealing with a, cu- a gun that either has like a higher rib or something like that that occludes the, the vision down the barrel is what I'm guessing. Um, yeah, but, so, probably... but I've, built, I've built a lot of high rib pro sporters with uh, non-Monte Carlo stocks too. So just depending on, just because of the rib, 
doesn't necessarily dictate that to me either. I'm going to still watch on how the person mounts it, how we're looking down the barrel, how everything comes together to what style of stock we're going to put them into and how we're going to make all that work gotcha. together. Hey, Sean, after seeing like what Jim does here today, yep, I know for what, like, for example, you have the adjustable comb up and then you have the um, butt pad of the stock tweaked over. Right. And that's how, we, that's how we got the gun to fit you. But I know after seeing how Jim does this, you would leave here with a tradi- a, what I would call a traditional looking stock. Gotcha. Gotcha. So it's, it's, it, he would just build that into the process after watching how he does it. You'll see my pattern stock, um, and then you'll see what I was shooting before. And you know how my stock is all tweaked right now. Yeah. Well, the gun, the pattern stock that I'm getting into looks nothing like that, and it fits me perfect. Gotcha. Well, I know with me being a bigger guy, and I've got kind of a longer neck and long arms and everything, I knew that I was going to have problems fitting in traditional guns. So when I bought this one, I kind of thought, well, you know, if i got to play around with it, this is probably the one to do it with. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, Jim, do you yeah. have any tree trunks you can use? Yeah, uh, I built some big. I got some big blanks at times. Sure. <laughs> I had a customer from Pennsylvania several years ago did one that, you know, he was like, uh, he was probably six foot seven, almost four hundred pounds, and he came up. It's funny. He goes, they say I need a custom stock. I'm like, yeah. I said, you just shooting a factory stock? He said, yeah. I said, well, I tell you, it doesn't fit. And he kind of looked at me. I'm like. Well, what else do you buy that fits you right off the shelf? <laughs> nothing else does. So, why do you think your gun stock is going to? He's probably a distant relative, I would imagine. So, yeah. we're probably born so, from the same ogre clan or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So we set him up in our new stock, and he was amazed at how different it felt, how he could get his finger on the trigger properly, how he set the grip up, and how much it changed the way the gun recoiled, everything else. So cool. Well, for a, a guy like me or maybe just a new guy getting started that does have an adjustable stock uh well you know my comb's adjustable i should say right you can get it pretty close i mean just to, for them to come to you and be fitted you can get it fairly yeah. close with what they have without a guy spending you know an arm and yeah. a leg right and even without adjustable combs we can dial them in we can either reshape the comb I do bending, stock bending as well to make adjustments there. So there's several different ways on a factory stock to get a person started to, to get it where they need to go and get the length and pitch angle and everything else set up properly for a person. Well, what I like about you, Jim, is you know you don't just fit the guy based on what you see when they're holding the gun. You go out with them. You want to see them shoot the gun. You want to see them put several rounds down range. And sometimes, especially if it's a custom stock, it's several thousand rounds. Like, come back and see me in a couple months, right? Yeah. So we start with the pattern board. Use the pattern board, not as the end all, but uh, see where we're going with it. See how it helps me watch them, how they actually mount. Because sometimes guys mount the gun different when we go shoot than what they've been doing into the shop here. Yeah. So we to see what they're do. Then I have three of the different of clay bots. So we run the clay bots out and shoot a lot of different targets off of those from trap birds to teal to crossers to just keep changing a wide variety so I can watch how the gun's recoiling for the shooter, how they transition, how they're feeling, watch the hand of them come back and make adjustments to it, to the stock, to the grip, different things that we're shooting and get feedback from the customer. Um, a lot of times we'll go out and shoot, start with it without a pad on it, just so I can see what recoil is happening, even without a recoil pad on the gun. You know, we're we're see talking what? an awful lot about the stock behind the receiver, but how much goes into the forearm, Jim? Is there a lot that goes on there, or maybe just a minimal amount? Um, a minimal amount. Part of it is personal preference on what they like. I do build some longer forearms, depending on if they have longer arms, we can make them longer. And some different shapes, beaver tail style to a slim round style. Um, part of us watching their hands and part of us watching what they feel and how they see. Normally on a pattern, I don't do a forend unless they want something really different, not happy with their factory forend at that time. On the final stocks, I always do forends with it, but, uh, but can do a pattern. Like yesterday, I did a forend pattern for the guy. He wanted a different style on his Kohler. So we changed the style and changed the shape of the forend around to, to make a different style and fit for him. Gotcha. 
Gotcha. All right, Jim. So here's a dumb question. I mean, it might be a dumb question for you. You've done so many stocks over the years, and I know that there's you know all kinds of guns that you have to fit and all kinds of people you have to fit. But I guess I'm going to guess that you're probably doing these stocks for more higher end guns, right? I mean, you're doing the Zolis and the 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 Parazis, the Kriegoffs, the Kohlers, so on and so forth. I mean, do you get people coming with you with the more common stuff like the, you know the the Beretta Autos or the 870s or Mossbergs yeah, or um, yeah, Beretta Autos have done some of the Fab Arm Autos. You know, Browning Seven Twenty Five done Six Ninety Fours. Some of those guys I know aren't going to move up. They're just going to keep shooting the pattern because of the price wise. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But uh, so that's why we do patterns all out of wood. So like on the A Four Hundred, do several of those, and you know those guys are just going to keep shooting that. They look. You know, a lot better than the factory stocks did anyway. Yeah, well, I, was, I was just asking. Be, I was just asking because it seems like at a, a certain price point, you know, it's like, hey, you've got a right. twelve hundred dollar gun or a fifteen hundred dollar gun. You're going to probably put maybe close right. to that into a stock. Does it make sense to do that with a gun? I put a lot of high end stocks on the the automatics as well. Okay. Um. So it just kind of depends if that's what they want to shoot and keep shooting. You know, we'll build a nice final stock out of it as well. Gotcha. Gotcha. So with all this work uh, on the guns, Jim, and <laughs> being on the range half the day, do you do you ever get out to shoot any, or do you still enjoy shooting any? Um, I enjoy it, just don't seem to get out very often. <laughs> I bet not. So, so I haven't shot a tournament or anything since nationals, but uh, I'm going to Southeast Regional, but I get to work that whole shoot. So <laughs> I think my son, he gets to shoot a lot more than I do. So, gotcha. Guys, you should. You should see this facility here. It's it's awesome. You've, it's yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, yeah, it's. I rent my shop here at a sporting clay range, so they've got a couple of courses set up, and uh, then facility where I can shoot, run the clay bots out, and uh, been here two and a half years, so it all works out good. Well, I was quiet just, out here and nice, and we can get everything done. I was I was just going to get to that, Jim. Um, where can people find you? How, how where are you located? Where is your your base shop located. Where can they come see you? Um, I'm located in Augusta, Kansas, which is 15 miles east of Wichita, so south central Kansas. I do go on the road a few times a year. Um, I work the U.S. Open always, and I work the Nationals. And then, like I said, I'm going to the Southeast Regional. Uh, I'm going to go to Will Fennels in South Carolina a couple times a year. And normally mix one other shoot somewhere in through that stage somewhere else. But the majority of it is here, here in Kansas, and book several patterns as people fly in, drive in from all over coming into here. Gotcha. Yeah, I basically, I flew out of Cleveland today. Flight left at 7.30. I was at the airport at 10 till 6. I was here at Jim's facility, and I even stopped at Billy Sims Barbecue on the way. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um and it was three turns basically three roads and i was here by twelve thirty. so nice it, it's very easy to get to well listen between the nachos belgrande and the barbecue you're not gonna be playing any <laughs> games soon tom brady <laughs> uh, uh, so jim if you would um i'd like to have a way everybody can get a hold of you can you give us like your website or do you have a phone number or anything anybody can go yep. to yeah, the website is greenwoodcustomstocks.com, and there's uh, my shop number on there. I can give my cell phone number as well. Um, it's, you know, 316-734-0747. I usually they can text me, call me on those numbers. Um, my email address is on the website. You can email me. However, normally for a pattern stock, get somebody in. Normally it's within normally about three weeks time. I can get a schedule time booked in for somebody to come in. Gotcha. I still have openings at the U S open that I'm booking for, you know, they're at uh, clay thorn. That's first part of June. And we do the patterns there. I take the trailer and have the patterns. We'll take the pattern out in a day there and do the same thing. They're just a little more hectic with people in and out, but we get it all done and get a, Pattern made the same way there out of the trailer. Gotcha. gotcha. Hey, Jim, you know, I forgot to ask you one thing, and I, I probably already know the answer to this. In your mind, what is your opinion of, like, the adjustable stocks, like, the, you know, the TSKs and stuff? Can you get an adjustable stock to fit as well as a custom stock, or is that just kind of a pipe dream? Um, yeah, I think you can. 
I've never messed with the TSKs personally, but uh, I messed with uh, some of the other stocks similar to that. Okay. I've been uh, seeing more and more what, of them. That was the reason I was asking. What you don't get out of it is just buying one off shelf is the custom grip feel. Um, and then, you know, if you like that look, I guess you're okay with that. Yeah, well, that's uh, the weird thing. You got to go for that Robotech type or that uh, Robocop right. type of look <laughs> <laughs> on right. your gun. So some guys, it probably doesn't matter to them, I imagine. Right. So, yeah. So, but yeah, they can be adjusted in with the comb and the cast and get the length and pitch and get all those twisted around and get them all set up and, and fit right. Gotcha. I know a lot of guys like those, but to me, it looks like they ripped C-3PO's arm off and stuck it on the back of your gun. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I, I just, to me, I like, the, I like the furniture. I like the wood. Uh, sure. I mean, Sure. Right. I've and seen I'm, some of Jim's. I, I don't know the weights. Most of them you can still get get them balanced and feeling right. Everything else too. So that that's critical to me is getting the balance point right. Still making the gun feel lively in our hands, um, so it moves right. So we're not butt heavy, barrel heavy, anything else. So we keep everything moving, flowing right too. Well, I didn't want to keep you too long, but you just. You just generated another question out of the Rambo brain here. Uh Uh, (laughs) Hold on to your hats. uh, You just said something about balance. So if you got a guy that wants more weight in the back of the gun, is that something you can do is put weights in it? Or do you just try to use like a heavier wood or you can do both. I mean, part of it, you know, when person, especially picking out a final piece of wood, you know, depending on the gun, what we're going after, we don't want to pick out a real heavy blank to start because, we're probably not going to get there, get the balance right. But normally on the patterns, yeah, we'll play with lead. I'll put some lead in the back end. Um, I hate stuff in the through bolt hole, so I drill a separate hole for that and get it all mounted in there properly and, and play with the weight and the balance. And, and some of that is shooter's input of whether they like one that's slightly barrel heavy or on the pin or, or where they want it to balance. And we have some input on that as well, what's going to feel right and, set everything up that way. So the gun, you know, it's feeling right, moves right, has good timing with it. Any plans? I know I'm just, now this is a pipe dream. Any plans on you coming up this way anytime soon, Jim? Have you talked about it, thought about it? Uh, I've thought about it. Just doing no plans yet. Um, been a long time I've been in Ohio and shot or done anything. So I need to get up that way one of these times, but schedule gets terribly busy for me trying to <laughs> oh, I bet. Here to too. I, i'm a one man i'm a one man deal when i leave nothing gets done either here, so. <laughs> oh the elves don't show up at night and get your work done for you <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i feel guilty keeping you on the phone this long because it sounds like you're a very busy individual but uh yeah. we we yeah. greatly appreciate your time that's for sure yeah so I enjoyed being on with you guys it's all good information and I like what you guys are doing well Thank jim you. thanks so much for coming on the show we really appreciate you being here you're welcome. Yep. We'll give you guys some photos and video, okay? Yeah, please do. We'll we'll uh, include it with the um, podcast when we launch it on social media. That'd be awesome. Okay. That sounds good. Awesome. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it very much. See you guys. Yeah. Thank you. You cannot tell me, Sean, that that man is not valid. Uh, he's been there, done that. Yes. <laughs> 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 you know, um, you and I were talking earlier the old saying is, is guns are meant to fit everyone, which means they fit no one. That's one of the best sayings out there. And, and that's the biggest problem. I mean, you go to like a big sporting goods store, you know, name one, Dick's, Cabela's, Bass Pro, whatever. And you go buy an off the shelf, whatever it is, Beretta, Remington, pick one. They're all made to fit everybody within a certain tolerance. Right. But you got a guy that's 6'6", or you got a guy that's 5'4", you got a guy that's 350 pounds, you got a guy that's 120 pounds. Right. And, and even on the women, you know, I know that there's a lot of women guns out there or ladies guns out there that quote unquote fit women better. But amongst women, there's going to be all kinds of different issues that they have. Right. Height, if, weight, right. Um, other things I'm not going to mention that might get in the way. But, you know, the, yes. the thing of it is, it's just... I guess aside what we've learned aside from the shells, aside from the chokes, aside from, you know, if you're shooting a vest or a shell bag or what glasses you're shooting, if that gun doesn't fit and it doesn't shoot and break clays where you're pointing it, what's what, why, what, right. what's, what's the issue? What's the point? Well, and you know, you made a good point about the ladies guns. Um, they're smaller frame. The guns mm-hmm. themselves are, mm-hmm. um, they're usually a little bit shorter, a little bit shorter length to pull yep. out of the, out of the box but usually a little less weight too right but let's be realistic here they don't make one 
women's shoe size. No, no. You know, and, and, and even if they all were seven and a half shoe size, they're, there's wide, there's skinny, there's high arch, low arch. You know, it's the same thing with a gun. Yeah. I mean, the, out of the, listen, no world champion or national champion can argue this fact. The gun fit is the most important thing in your game. Yeah. Write if, that down and, and repeat it over yeah, and over and over again. Yeah. So if the gun doesn't fit, it's, I don't care what you you're wasting on, time. You're wasting your time. Right. I don't because care what at you some point on. you got to get it fit and then you can start shooting and then you can start learning and then you know exactly how good you are. Exactly. Yeah. And but not I, until, but not until it doesn't matter what you spend on shells or glasses or vest or chokes or your side by side gun doesn't fit if it's not shooting where you're looking you're, you're, you might as well be ray charles yeah there. and again we keep saying this over and over and over again this is why we started this podcast right here this is it this conversation being able to get information out to our listeners who are just new getting started or thinking about getting started into the game gun fit gun fit gun fit gun fit i don't really care what gun you shoot what brand what length whether right. it's an auto whether it's an over under whether it's got the fanciest wood in the world if it doesn't fit you there's no point. Right. And, you know, just like I asked Jim, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be a custom stock. You no. can work with what you have. Exactly. He's going to get you fit into that gun. Now, you know, down the road, if you'd like a nice pretty piece of furniture, by God, he can he can help you out there. Yeah. But the man can help you with what you have. Right. And, and probably, to be honest with you, very, very economically compared to a custom stock. Right. Um. I don't see any reason why not to go see Jim. If you're if you're a new shooter or you just bought a new gun, I wouldn't even go to the range until the, you went and got fit. Right. And yeah. uh, and to be fair, I mean Jim's the greatest guy in the world, but obviously he can't take care of everybody. Oh, so yeah, right. in your neck of the woods, whether it's, you know, California, Florida, Midwest, New York, there's guys around that have good reputations about knowing how to fit a gun to you. And those are the people you want to seek out. Talk to your clubs, talk to your uh, pros, talk to anybody out there that gives lessons. They're going to be able to point you in the right direction. And if you can't get with Jim, you know, I'm sure they can get you somebody that's, you know, qualified right. to do what that that, or, that takes. Or maybe maybe it's a phone call or an email to Jim and say, hey, yeah. you know, are you going to be coming out this way anytime soon? Well, I'll be out there in September. Okay, well, it's right. January and I just got this new gun. Can you point me in the right direction to a guy that can help me yeah. until you can get out here? And I'm sure know? he can. I'm right. sure he can. So, but, um, big thanks to Jim. Um, yeah, that's a great topic of conversation and one that's probably not spoken about enough. I mean, we talk all the time about shells and chokes and sure. You know, all the accessories, the glasses, the shooting vest, but you know, again, it boils down to it. That, and, and that is number one on your list to get taken care of is your gun fit. Just so everybody knows, Sean and I had a conversation earlier. Um, we gave up the first two years. Um, oh, yeah. I, I would say the first two years we started competing, we, we pretty much gave it up as far as we were fighting with our guns because they didn't fit. They didn't fit. And then once we got fit, and then, of course, I got with a coach, and, mm -hmm. you know, the rest is history. But Yeah, if we could have that time machine and go back and knowing right. knowing now what, right. what what the deal is, we would have done it a lot differently. So, see, I sound just like my dad now. Learn from my mistakes. Don't do the dumb things I did. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, <laughs> Well, hey, listen, we got a questions for the coaches segment coming up here. Um, Mike Luongo is going to come on and answer some questions. It was Gavin's turn in the Gavin's turn in the rotation, but however, um, I think just coming off the heels of that Western Regional, I think him and Karen must have spent a little time, you know, well needed time off. Um, haven't been able to get in touch with him, but uh, Mike said he'd jump in and fill some shoes for us. So let's get to Mike. Um, and this segment is brought to you by Bear Pelt. It's not just your vest, it's your new uniform. So let's give uh let's give Mike a call. Let's do it. All right. How you doing this evening, Mike? I'm doing great. How you guys doing? Doing great, Mike. How you been? All good. Just uh going this that time of the year. What uh what what's Mike been up to? Are you are you coaching? Are you setting targets, doing a little all the above or what? Uh, basically all the above and then tomorrow i've got over a 200 person uh corporate shoot fundraiser actually for uh it's called brothers in blue 809 foundation it's pretty neat it's for a uh officer who got uh killed in the line of duty and uh so they help out uh and and do a big ordeal for him every year it's, it's pretty neat stuff that's cool 
I'm, that's that's cool to hear you're doing something like that. Absolutely. Well, hey, Mike, uh, appreciate you jumping in this week on the questions for the coaches. Um, we've got two questions here. One is from Tom Watts, and he asks, should you practice with tighter chokes than you would normally use in competition? And this is a good question. We kind of get this one a lot, actually. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I kind of have a rule of thumb on that one. Uh, I think if you're a, you know, experienced shooter, um, I think you can shoot any choke you want. I think if you're a newer shooter, you know, I personally don't recommend for a newer shooter to shoot a super tight choke. Uh, I just want to get them the confidence that, Hey, breaking targets. And, you know, you hear a lot of things like, Oh, you know, I want to see where I'm missing. Well, probably a newer shooter doesn't really know, you know, where he's missing yet, you know? So I like to see breaks kind of training the brain to just break targets and, you know, hit targets. And I think it's kind of the level you're at. I think if you're a really good shooter or experience, you know, I'd probably shoot whatever choke you want. I think if you're a newer shooter, I mean, my recommendation personally would to shoot, you know, shoot a choke, a, a more open choke. I'm not saying like a skeet choke, but like improved cylinder, you know, light mod, you know, two of my favorite chokes. I think that's a great choke for everybody uh, to use, you know. Yeah, I know that um, Sean and I's coach really stresses if you've got screw in chokes, that's another tool in your bag. Use them. You know, I mean, don't be afraid to change chokes between stations. And, you know, if you've got something right up close in your face, open it up. If it's if Yeah, it's, I mean, I do. I mean, I tell people my philosophy on that is, hey, I'm, I'm not perfect, right? I'm not a human machine. So if I can get a little help, you know, I'll, I'll take all the help I can get, you know. Right. That's right. Just like a golfer, you're not going to use your driving wood to, uh, to putt with. So you might as well use the right tool for the job. <laughs> 100%. 100%. Yep. Gotcha. All right, well, that's awesome there. Uh, all right, your next question is uh, from Matt Hayes, and Matt asks, have you recently came across a target you had no idea what sort of lead to give it, and what did you do to overcome that problem or, or solve that issue? You know, I think that's a great question. I think uh, first thing we got to do is blame the target setter, right? That's right, the first thing <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, you know, so it's, it's always their fault. No, I mean, um, you know, I haven't. Uh, I'll share something with that. I was actually at the uh, Caribbean Cup, uh, and, you know, two sh I shot the Caribbean Cup and the Seminole Cup this year. Both tournaments, I had one station where I never uh, hit a bird uh, specifically on. So I've been really working on, you know, trying to read birds better. I think they were two great targets. And I think uh, what I've, you know, found out is, hey, what's the definition of insanity? Don't do the same thing over and over. Right. right. The same right. results. And that's what I kind of been doing. I think, you know, kind of change it up. My, my rule of thumb is always go back to the bird a little closer to the bird. Um, I see more people over lead a target, uh, especially as a competition shooter than under lead a target. You know what I mean? And I mean, we can get a whole thing about lead and what you see and all that. I don't want to get into that, but I think start, you know, closer to the bird and kind of let the bird, work off the bird let the target move you you know what i mean let the target kind of move your gun and feel more connected with it you know maybe don't start so big with a big gap on it i mean it all depends on the presentation but i know for a fact like the caribbean cup they had a little bird and i missed it all three times and a buddy of mine set the targets and i go what spring you got on that trap he goes baby spring i go yep I just missed in front of it all three times, <laughs> you know what I mean? And I had a shooter, uh, I watched a couple shooters, uh, just drill it. And I kind of looked down and I mean, they were giving it probably you know, nothing to, to a little bit of lead. And I had, you know, I was, you could have drove a school bus when I was giving the thing, just a bad misread, you know, it's first shooter out. Um, and I didn't do anything right. <laughs> so we yeah. can all fail at that, you know? Oh, it happens to the best of us. I, I mean. think that kind of boils back to your post shot routine. Wouldn't it, Mike? In other words, to analyze what you did and it's okay. Now it's time to reset and try something different, right? Absolutely. You know, everybody talks about the pre shot. It's a great subject. Nobody talks about the post shot a lot and post shots just as important, you know, saying, okay, you know, what did I do there? And if you have no idea, well, man, try something different. You might know, say, oh, my God, you know, made a bad move or took my eye off the target. But it, if you're, like, clueless in the box, 
the on a shot the best recommendation i could do you know tell people is try something different and you know depending on the speed of the bird but i would always start a little closer and try to feed off the bird a little bit if you're lost you know right. uh let that bird kind of let you make a move you know you know it's funny because i just had something happen to me in a recent tournament and i was missing the second target it was four pair on the station and i'm like i, I something's goofy is going on here and it's weird because my solution was to change where I was hitting the first bird. In other words, I forced myself to be more aggressive on the first bird and take it sooner. So I was catching that second bird on more of a flat line instead of into its transition. All of a sudden, it was dead pair, dead pair from then on out. So it's it's funny because, like you say, you know, a lot of guy worries about how much lead to give something. Sometimes it's just that post-shot routine and that thought process of how I'm going to approach that target differently, not necessarily how much lead I'm going to give it. That's, that's, that's a fact. I mean, the, um, you know, I mean, it never uh, goes in my mind, Hey, I'm going to give that bird, you know, 12 feet of lead. Well, to, you know, Sean, it might seem like it's, you know, two feet of lead to me, it's, you know, 15 feet of lead to you. You know what I mean? So I never get into that topic. Uh, with people I'm like okay because one thing we fail to realize is in the shooting sports you know nobody even as a coach I can't look through somebody's eyes right I don't know what they're seeing exactly. through their brain and their eyes so I try to work on different things of what I can control you know as far as okay where they're starting the gun you know the speed of their gun their you know the whole setup and, you know what they're doing at the end of the shot you know, work on stuff like that. Not necessarily, Oh, I got to give it 10 feet to leave. Well, what's 10 feet. You know what I mean? Right. So right. for sure. Well, Mike, Hey, listen, I, I know you're busy, man. I'm going to let you run. Um, really appreciate you stepping up tonight and, and helping us out with these questions for the coaches. And, uh, we've got a ton of them coming in and I ask everyone, please listening. If you've got a question, send it in. We've got Great coaches like Mike here on the phone with us that are more than willing to help you guys out. So don't hesitate to send those questions in. But, yeah, for uh, sure. We want to try to help the shooters out in any way we can. I mean, I tell everybody, you know, information we can get out there to, you know, grow the sport or help somebody that's struggling that might not be able to, you know, go see a coach. You know, um, that's a great – I think I encourage people to listen to these podcasts as well because, you know, myself and Anthony shot with a guy – um, at the Seminole Cup, and you know the nearest range for him is like three hours. And he goes, I don't even have a coach in my area. You know what I mean? So he was talking about podcasts, and I, was, I thought that was neat. So people are listening, and if we can help out, I think it's a great thing. Well, you good. Know? That's good. That that makes Sean and I feel better because it tells us we're heading in the right direction with what we're trying to do. Absolutely, so, for sure. But well, Mike, thank you again, sir. We greatly appreciate it, and uh, we'll be talking to you soon. Yeah, thanks, Mike. All right. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you, guys. Have a good evening. All right, see you. Yes, sir. Well, it's always great catching up with Mike. He's always got a ton of information, and uh, it was nice for him to fill in that since uh, Gavin couldn't be there. Yeah, for sure. Good dude, for sure. Hey, questions for the coaches, everybody. So, now, I'm going to wrap this up again. Um, we have Julia Stallings. Any of you girls out there that want a question answered from a female coach, she's agreed to be part of questions for the coaches. Uh, we now have Don Grant. Uh, any mental training or any kind of, you know, mental questions, um, feel free to send those in. Of course, we're going to have Bill Elliott with us. Uh, Mike Luongo is going to continue to be on. And new addition. Um, we are not, trust me, no way, shape, or form are we eliminating Gavin. We're just going to keep going with the rotation. We're going to come back to Gavin uh, here in the near future. But Kevin DeMichael, Kevin DeMichael is now coming on for questions for the coaches. So please keep those questions coming in. Uh, doesn't matter how you send it to us. Social media, email, doesn't matter. Get those questions to us, please. And thank you, Bear Pelt. Uh, it's not just your vest. It's your new uniform. Thank you for sponsoring that segment. Yeah. Well, it was a great interview with, uh, with everyone. I mean, another great show. Um, Jim was great to talk to. A lot of information there. And, again, big thank you to Mike to step in and, uh, and take the questions for the coaches. Really nice to hear from people like that. Yeah, for sure. And speaking of thank yous, Game Board, the most decorated fee task and sporting clay shot shells in the sports history. Thank yeah. you, Game Board. Yeah, absolutely. And we don't want to forget about Negrini. We case your memories. And certainly, last but not least, R.E. Ranger. See it further. See it faster. See it with precision with R.E. Ranger. Ah, but that's not last because Atlas Traps, oh. American-made 
Atlas Traps, the finest equipment in Clay Target Sports. I, I stand corrected. I stand man, corrected. I was racing to the finish line, man. I'm sorry. That's my bad. Jeez. <laughs> take your time in the box there. I man. know. Got to take time. Got to take time. It's not drag yeah. racing, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's good, man. I mean, another good show. And looking yeah. forward to it. we got a whole bunch of stuff lined up for you guys. And, again, you know, keep going out there. Uh, take people shooting. Uh, Throw us your questions. Post on our Dead Pair Public page on Facebook. You know, we love hearing from you guys and gals. Uh, we really, really appreciate the support of the show yep. and look forward to this every each and every time. We got a great email from a guy the other day. Said that he is ate up with it now because of listening to us. Um, he's went out, spent a whole bunch of money yeah. on the products that we <laughs> recommended. So um, we, we hope he's enjoying the sport. And I know the products that we've recommended are what we have found are going to last you for a really long time. Um, we spent money in the wrong direction. We've sent it a hundred times. Yep. So it was great hearing from him. And we get the tons of those emails every day and we love hearing from people. Don't hesitate to write good or bad. We want to hear what you, what your thoughts are and your ideas. Um, love hearing from you. Yeah. And no doubt. Uh, also show ideas, you know, again, reach out to us, let us know, is there something that you want us to talk about, whether it's a certain type of gear whether it's a certain person that you want to hear from. I mean, let us know. We're, we're working for you guys and trying to bring you what you want. Yeah, we got a ton lined up. We, we yes, we do. We've got a ton lined got up. Got a good but, list. But, hey, it's not to say we're, we're not open to criticism and we're not open to ideas. We'll always take ideas. So Absolutely. Send them to us. Well, Sean, let's run, man. That's been a heck of a show. Yeah, um, that's a wrap. Got some good good information there from Jim and from Mike and hopefully – Hopefully everybody put it in the memory bank. Yeah, hopefully see you all back here on the next episode of The Dead Pair.